Love you, Joseph. Thanks so much, Pastor. Well, good morning. Such a privilege to be here. I so appreciate Pastor Jeff and Pastor Weaver and uh, staff and missions committee and just an incredible church that uh, decided to take this time to focus on India, to focus on the world. It would have been very easy probably just to take a year off. I mean, last two years have been tough. And we could have just said, you know what, why don't, we just, why don't we just take care of ourselves this year? But I applaud you for being a people that are lifting up your eyes, even when it's hard, it's easy to look down. Sometimes it's easy to look down it, and look at our problems, but to lift up your eyes and say, God, we are involved with you in the things that matter to you. So thank you for uh, your heart for India and the world. I'm going to read this morning from uh, Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. I wish my family could have been here with me today. Uh, I'm actually flying out today at 3.30. I get on the plane and... Uh, and I'm going to arrive in India this afternoon. Uh, tomorrow, I arrive in India. My uh, sons are there, and we're doing some work there. So pray for us in our journeys, and uh, just uh, thank you for allowing me to be here with you. Genesis chapter 4, begin reading in verse 2. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the first fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord, and Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. You need to know that, that the opposition that God has here is not about what's being brought. It's not that God prefers an animal sacrifice more than he preferred a grain or a, or a vegetable sacrifice. At this point in scripture, God has not given any indication about what should be sacrificed. He's actually not even asked for a sacrifice. There's nothing in scripture that says God's asked for anything. So this was simply Cain and Abel coming and out of their heart saying, God, we want to give something to you. But there was something different in the offering. There was something in Abel's offering that said, God, I love you. I just want to honor you. I just want you to know how much I value you. And there's something in Cain's offering that said something to the point of, God, what I want you to do for me. What, what am I looking to get from you? How can I manipulate you? I want to tell you that God doesn't look at the offering you give. He looks at the attitude of your heart. And if your heart is right before God, if your heart's desire is right, it doesn't matter if you're given a dollar or a million dollars. It doesn't matter the level. What matters is a heart of worship to God, a heart that says, God, I love you, and everything I have belongs to you. Verse 6, then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right... Will it not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? Where is your brother Abel? Something you need to know about Scripture so that you can theologically discern Scripture. This is a very important point. God never asks a question because he needs information. So God is what we would call omniscient. He knows all things. God is not confused as to the whereabouts of Abel. He's not confused as to what Cain has done to Abel. But whenever God asks a question, God is offering an opportunity. Everybody say with me, opportunity. There's an opportunity in this moment for Cain. There is this opportunity of, God, I lost my head. I, I got so angry. I, I, I couldn't control myself. I had rage. I killed my brother. God, forgive me. God is always gracious. He is always loving he is always kind. He is always offering opportunities for repentance. 
Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad that no matter what you have done, no matter how far you have gone, God is always offering opportunities to us. But Cain doesn't take the opportunity. He does what we often do. He tries to divert. He tries to hide. He tries to confuse. And so Cain answers, I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? That's just a fascinating question, isn't it? Am I my brother's keeper? Why, why are you asking me about Abel? My name's Cain. I've got my own family. I've got my own issues. Why ask me about him? If you want to find Abel, go find him yourself. If you want about Abel, go find him. Go talk to him. I mean, why are we here talking about missions? Why are we talking about India? We're Americans. We got our own issues. We got our own problems. Why are we, why are we interested in what's happening in Ukraine? Other than gas prices are higher, it's not affecting us. Am I Ukraine's keeper? Am I India's keeper? Am I really responsible for anybody other than me? It wasn't like this in the beginning. The Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the creation narrative is of, of God creating things that are good. And then it says that God created us, and, and he created us different than the animals and the birds and the fish. He, he did something different with us than he did with trees and vegetation. It says that literally God breathed into us. That God, God poured into us something into us that he didn't give to animals. So in all the history of the world, no scientist, no biologist has ever discovered a vegan lion. And they've been found. <laughs> Nobody has ever found a great white shark that had a moral dilemma and decided to eat kelp. So I just can't do this anymore. These poor fish. <laughs> Look at them dying. They're flopping. I just can't do it anymore. Maybe this green stuff tastes good. They can't do it. Because they don't have what you and I have. You see, because God is a God of love, he, he wanted to create some things that could truly worship him. And in order to truly love there, there's something that required. Because God is love, God is not a God of coercion. He's not a God of force. You see, love requires the most dangerous thing in the world. Love requires freedom. And how many of you know freedom is dangerous? How many of you know that? Some of you are old enough to have had 16-year-old kids and you're looking in the eyes of your 16-year-old son, and you're thinking, man, this is, this is a bad decision. But then for the first time, I put keys in his hand. This is a bad decision. <laughs> this ain't gonna turn out right. <laughs> My insurance is about to go up double <laughs> because he's not capable of making good decisions. <laughs> but because I love my son, I don't lock him up. Everything inside of me would tell me, lock him up till he's at least 25 until he's capable of making sound decisions. But I let him loose on the world. I give him freedom, why? Because I love my son. Because love requires freedom. And God did this with us. God created us and breathed a part and he gave us freedom. We were created to have relationship with God, relationship with one another, to walk in the beauty of unity and harmony with God and one another. And there is this image that the Bible paints in, 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 in Genesis chapter two. It says this, it says, in Adam and Eve, they were naked and they were unashamed. The image is they had nothing to hide, completely transparent. There was no jealousy, there was no anger, there was no bitterness, there was no unforgiveness. There was complete, transparent, perfect unity with God 
and with one another, we have nothing to hide. Can you imagine living like that? That I'm not worried about anybody's gonna find out what I did in the dark, that nobody's gonna hear what I said about them, that nobody's gonna know what my actual feelings towards them, that we just have perfect intent and perfect unity together. That's how God created us, and that's what God created us for, to have perfect relationship with him and with one another. And you see in the garden this image of every day God comes down and walks through the garden with them. Do you know what that's, that's what you were created for? You were created to be a gardener. You were created just to take care of God's creation and enjoy creation that he has given us in his presence, that that's what we were created for. But because God is love and because God gives freedom, he put a mechanism of freedom in the garden. He put two trees and said everything else is your, just don't eat of the two trees. There you go, the first temptation. The enemy said, you know what? God's not actually looking out for you. God's trying to keep something good from you. There's more than him. You can be a God to yourself. Why, why are you living on his rules? If you will eat of the tree, this tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll be like God. You can be your own God. You can make your own rules. You can make your own decisions. You can live life on your terms. You don't have to listen to anybody else. Be your own God. And Adam and Eve, they bought the lie. And here comes God, as he always does. He comes to walk with them. And notice this. God knows what's happening. And God asked them a question. Adam and Eve, where are you? Why does God ask questions? Why does God ask? He doesn't need information. What does he need? He's offering an opportunity. Adam and Eve, where are you? Where are Adam and Eve? They're hiding from God. You see, we do not serve an angry, bitter God who is hiding from us. It is we who are hiding from God. Sin doesn't cause God to hide from us. Sin causes us to hide from God. And even in their sin, God is still coming. He's offering an opportunity. Where are you? There's an opportunity, God. We sinned. We did what you told us not to do. We, we were sorry. Lord, forgive us. God is offering an opportunity to them. It says they're put out of the garden. And if you actually see in the Hebrew, the word that says God put them out of the garden is the same word used throughout the Hebrew scripture for divorce. The image is of God saying, yeah, if you, don't, if you want to hide from me, if you don't want to be with me, I'm not going to force you to stay in my house. Remember the prodigal son? The father never forces us to stay in his house. If you don't want to be with me, if you want to hide from me, I will give you the papers. I'll let you go. I'm not going to force you to be in relationship with me because I'm love, because I give freedom. You're going to have to make your own choice. He gives them the freedom, and they choose we're going out. And now Adam and Eve are out of the garden. And where is God? He's still there. He's still there. They're running from God. And where is God? He's still right there talking to Cain and Abel. He's still there offering himself to them. He's still there offering redemption to them. But what do we see? If you are not in right relationship with God, you cannot be in right relationship with one another. When your relationship with God breaks down, fundamentally, all the relationships of your life start to break down. And this is the, the story, the history of the Old Testament. This is the history of the world. Because we're not in right relationship with God, brother fights against brother. Family fights against family. City fights against city. Nation fights against nation. Ethnicity fights against ethnicity. Language fights against nation. People against people. Why? Because our relationship with God is not right. All the relationships of our lives break down. What a tragic story. What a tragic history we have. But then... Along came Jesus. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> but then along came Jesus. And I want you to see the image that Jesus is dying on the cross. Now remember, God hasn't left us even though we've left him. So where is God? God's in the tabernacle. 
He says, build a tent. I want to go with you. You can't come into my presence because of your sinfulness, but I still want to be with you. They built Jerusalem, built me a temple. Why? Because I want to be with you. And in the temple, in the tabernacle, it says there was a place, the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest, one person, once a year, could come in the presence of God on behalf of all people. And, and that, that place, there was a veil, there was a, there was a curtain that separated so that nobody could come in because of our sin had separated us from God. There was a veil in the temple. It was over 45 feet tall. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus breathed his last breath, that the earth itself began to shake. And it says in that moment, the veil of the temple was torn from the top down to the bottom from the top where only God could reach. It was torn so that we now have access, that through the death and resurrection of Christ, we now have access again to walk into the garden and to walk with God and to experience God's presence again. That's the good news of the Bible. That is the good news that Jesus has made a way for us to come into his presence. And once Jesus made a way, after his death and resurrection, for 40 days, Jesus walks with these, with these apostles and these disciples, and he's teaching them about the kingdom. And then Jesus is resurrected on the 40th day. He ascends into heaven. The Spirit of God is poured out on them, and this new people are gathered together, new people who have been made right with God and I want you to notice these new people who are now back in right relationship with God I want you to see the effect these new people they start to gather together and they do some of the things we're doing today they studied the apostles teaching they they worship together they prayed together they broke bread together but I want you to see the effect on this community Acts chapter 2 verse 44 listen to the effect on this community all the believers were together and had everything, say with me everything, they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone, say with me anyone, strangers and foreigners, family and enemy and friend, whoever you were, anyone who was in need. Acts chapter 4. They're filled with the Spirit again. They continue on in this grace. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. All the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything. Say with me, everything. They shared everything they had. Why? Because we're family. We're part of the family of God. We are the people of God. And what I owe my brother, I now owe to you. What I owe my sister, I now owe to you. There's an Indian theologian who is a great friend of mine. He puts it like this. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the womb. I have brothers Sisters, mother, father, we are connected genetically through the water of the womb. We are, we are connected by birth, but you and I are connected by something thicker than that. We are connected by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he has taken people from, from all genetic <laughs> makeups from all backgrounds from all race from all tribes and, and now we are one in Christ Jesus and this new community realized we are now family when I first got saved in church they you know I, I prayed and asked the Lord in my heart and they this uh, person took me to introduce me to the pastor and said hey I want to introduce you to our pastor his name is brother Carol and I looked at him and, and I wasn't from a church background I didn't know anything about church and I just said well I don't think he's my brother he looks too old to be my brother I think he's older than my dad so I, I don't see how he could be my brother and they say, oh, no, that's what we say, you know, to know, you know like we, we just show honor. We call them, you know, brother. That's in the South. You, you, you'd never call a person by their name. You'd always call them brother. And then they introduced me to, to his wife. They said, and this is Sister Carol. And I said, okay, so Sister Carol, I got that. 
And in our times, we use terms like that to show respect and honor. In the early church, you'll see throughout, they, they used these terms brothers and sisters, but to them, it was a signal of our new relationship. That whatever I owe my flesh and blood, I now owe to you. You're now part of my family. I, I preach at a lot of colleges, and, and, uh, and recently I was up in New York, and, and I go to get something out of the refrigerator at this, this college. You know, it's like, it's like a college house where a bunch of kids live. And I opened the refrigerator, and I couldn't get anything because everything had somebody's name on it. Because if you're in college and you don't write your name on it, it's gone. It's probably gone even if you write your name on it. This one kid told me, he said, hey, my mom made me some brownies. You want some? I said, yeah. And he goes in his sock drawer and brings out brownies, which kind of, it's kind of killed the idea. He said, no, but you know, if I, if I put them over there, everybody's going to eat them. i got to hide them so that nobody takes them. But in my house, nobody's allowed to write their name on the milk. Nobody gets to have their food. If it's in my house, it's ours. So when my son comes up to me and said, hey, what happened to my leftover pizza from last night? I said, that wasn't your leftover pizza. That was our leftover pizza, and I ate it. <laughs> it belongs to the family if it's in the house. One of the curses I have, I have three grown sons who all wear the same size shoe as me. I can't have nice things. I bear a new, buy a new pair of shoes, and I come, and they're gone. A week later, my son sews up, and they got holes in them. But because we're family, we share. In the family, you have everything. Say with me, everything. Everything in common. There is radical generosity that takes place when you feel a sense of connection. That if there's one person in the family who's hungry, we're, that means we're all hungry because we're not going to let anybody go without. If there's one person in the family suffering, we're all suffering because we're connected in our hearts. If there's one person in the family's blessed, we're all blessed because we're connected. Let's keep reading in Acts chapter 4, verse 33. With great power, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. What, what would come to your mind when you think about great power? Were they raising the dead, opening blind eyes? Were they feeding multitudes? Were they calming the seas? What were they doing? What is this great power? And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. That's grace. That's powerful. Can you imagine the grace of God so powerfully at work in your heart that you just had to get involved? That you just had to care? That you just had to have concern? That you just had to intervene? The grace of God that would so powerfully work in your life that you would lay down your life for the other? Let me tell you, if there's a burning building, fear has never caused anybody to run into a building to save somebody else. Fear is what keeps you out of the building. What pushes you into the building is love. And sometimes you don't have to be a fireman to run in the building. You just have to care. You just have to care. You just have to have enough love for whoever's inside to say, you know what, we may both die. I may die. We may both live. Whatever the consequences, I got to do it. Love is what drives you into the building. And let me tell you, in a world that is burning today, you see what's happening in Ukraine today. You hear the stories in Syria, in Yemen, in Ethiopia. We, we see a world that's on fire, and fear will never drive you into the world. Fear will never get you involved, but it is the love of God that his grace so powerfully works in our hearts that the love of God wells up within us into compassionate acts that forces us to get involved. When I was living in Laos, I lived 15 years in India, then moved to Laos for six years, and then we've been back in India ever since. When I was living in Laos, I had a neighbor who was sick. 
When I lived in Laos, the house that I lived in was right next to the temple. My window opened up to the Buddhist temple. And I, I thought I got a good deal on the house. It was cheap rent, and I thought I got a good deal. And my first night there, I found out I was a sucker. Have you ever had one of those situations? Because first night, 4 o'clock in the morning, the drum started beating, and the drum was about 10 feet from my head <laughs> at the temple. Boom, 4 o'clock in the morning. And from 4 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the morning, there were drums, there were bells, and they were just beating and ringing for two hours every morning. Those were my alarm clock every day. Help helped me to pray. So, so God used the strange and mysterious things to get us up and help us to pray. So every morning, my neighbor, he was the best bell ringer there was. He would be in there. I mean, he's just striking it. I mean, he's retired, and, and Buddhists are trying to build up merit and favor so that they come back in a better life. So, so he's in there every morning banging on the bell, beating the drum, and, and then I'd see him out cutting the grass of the temple, and, you know, like he was, he was really involved. He's, he's, he's really looking for a better life. And then one day, I started noticing the drums aren't beating as early. And then I didn't see my neighbor out cutting grass. And then I noticed... One morning, hey, it's, it's not banging at all. Nobody's, nobody's banging the drum today. They missed it. What happened? So I went to my neighbor, and he's sick. So I asked my neighbor, hey, let, let's go to the hospital together. So we go to the hospital, get him a checkup. And I, I don't want you to have grand delusions about what a hospital looks like in Laos. We had chicken wire over the windows of the emergency room. There, this is not what you would think of as a hospital. It's more like a clinic. And so uh, they run some blood tests on him, come back. A few days later, we go back and got the report. He's dying. There's no hope. He's not going to make it. So I asked the doctor, and I said, you're, you're telling me there's nothing we can do to help him? He said, yeah, there's treatment, but there's no way he can afford it. Look at him. He doesn't have a car. He has no money. The closest hospital is 12 hours away in Thailand. He doesn't have a car to get there, and even if he did, he doesn't have money to pay for it. No reason to give him false hope. Better for him to go home and die at peace. I said, how much money are we talking about? And he gave me a figure of like $20,000 just to get started. I don't have $20,000. So I take him home, and once we get home, we live right across from each other, and we, we get to the little road where we live, and I told him, I said, Mr. Old, I'd help you if I could, but I don't have money, but but I will pray. I believe Jesus is a healer. You know I serve Jesus, and so, so I prayed for him. That night, I get ready to go to bed. I, I kneel down beside the bed that night, and I start to pray. Jesus, would you please heal my neighbor, Mr. Oat? And when I did, I just felt the still, small voice of the Spirit speak to me. What would you do if he was your father? Hmm, what would I do if he's my father? And I stopped praying. I thought, well... If he was my father, I wouldn't let him die. I mean, if there was a small chance he could live, I guess I'd do whatever I had to do. I'd max credit cards out, take a loan, mortgage something. I'd do what I had to do. I'm not going to let my father die. And I just felt like the Lord speak to me and say, treat him like he's your father. So the next day I go back to his house and I said, Mr. Ode, I, I treated you like a stranger yesterday. You're not a stranger. So you don't know this yet, but we were created by the same God. We were created in his image, so you're family to me. You're, you're, you're my brother, and I'm going to treat you like family. Get ready. We're going to go to the hospital this week. So a couple days later, we get in the car. We drive 12 hours to uh, Thailand. We started his treatment. They said from here on out, he'll have to be back once a week probably for the rest of his life, and his life may not be long. And I said, okay. So we took him there, come back, and that started our journey of well, once a month for the next uh, for the next years, we started doing it, and uh, it's been almost 12 years now, and he's still alive today. A couple of years into this journey, one day uh, I felt like the Lord leading us to go back to India. So I went and sat with him. I introduced him to some of my Lao friends, and I said, listen, I've worked it out with the hospital. They're going to bill me. Everything's going to be okay. My Lao, these are brand new Lao disciples. They're, they're going to take you there. They're going to take care of you. Don't worry about it. We're, we're still going to take care of you. A couple days later, I'm getting in my truck to go to the airport. And uh, a little child from the village comes and gets me and said, Mr. Oat wants to see you one more time before you leave. He said, it's really important. So I run to his house. I'm late. I got to get to the airport. And I run in the house. And I say, I I'm sorry, did I forget something? Is there something I forgot? And he said, and he sat up. By now, he can't walk anymore. But he sits up in his bed. He said, I just want you to know before you go, I consider you like my son. You are my son. And 
Because we're family, I want it to be your God is my God. Would you pray for me? I want to, I want to know Jesus. And his wife jumped out of the kitchen and said, you're my son too. I want to know Jesus too. And there's a church that meets in their home today. They're leading friends and neighbors to the Lord because of a simple idea to treat the world like family. To just be concerned. I mean, this is the bare minimum that God asks us to do, to care. <laughs> do we care? Are we concerned? The bare minimum when you see images of Ukraine is just to care. To not cut your heart off and say, oh, that, that hurts and turn the channel. It's just to care. It's a bare minimum that we as followers of Christ should have. When my sons are struggling, nobody has to remind me to pray for my children because I'm connected to them. And when my sons are struggling, it's hard to go to sleep at night. I, I go to sleep with them. They're on my mind. I wake up in the middle of the night thinking about their best. I, I wake up in the morning and it's with me through the day because I care about them. I, I, I'm constantly gravitating toward their good. And that is what God has called us to, to the world, to care for the world like we care for our own. To answer the question, yes, I am my brother's keeper. Yes, I am my neighbor's keeper. Yes, I am the keeper of Des Moines and Urbandale. Yes, I am the keeper of Iowa. Yes, I am the keeper of America. Yes, I am the keeper of India, Ukraine. That Jesus Christ, who said all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, now I am sending you with the authority. You are responsible for the world around you. Your first concern might be, well, you just can't do that for everybody. I mean, you just can't physically do that for everybody. My retort to you is, start with somebody. Start with somebody. The fact that you can't do everything for everybody doesn't relieve you of doing something for somebody. Amen? Start with somebody. I want to ask you guys this week to pray. God, who's somebody in my life? Somebody that's depressed, somebody that's broken, somebody that lost a job, somebody that got thrown out of their house, somebody that's been abused. Who, who's somebody in my life that I can treat like family? Is there a refugee, a stranger that has come into my, who is somebody that I can embrace the way you have embraced me? Who's somebody I can treat like family? Who's somebody that I can share his love with the way God has shared his love with? with me. This year, your church prayerfully decided we're going to embrace India this year. You might not can change all the world, but you can be a part of changing India this year. When we talk about buying a buffalo and a goat, we have pastors who live in villages that I have had pastors come to me in tears because their children had not been to school in over two years because they had no money to pay for school. And by giving them a buffalo, they can sell the milk from the buffalo, and now their kids are going to school, and they're able to do the work of the kingdom. That's good. We're able to give goats to families so they can raise goats, so they can sell the goats, so that they can provide for their families, so they can do the work of the kingdom. We're able to start businesses that give us connection in communities. We have gyms and soccer coaching academies and coffee shops just where we can live in community, share the love of Christ, and we have house churches being formed out of gyms today, house churches being formed out of coffee shops today, people being transformed. Together, with concern, we can change the world. But the Crucial question is simply this. Are you your brother's keeper? Are you responsible? Sin would tell you, I'm not responsible for the stranger. I'm not responsible for that guy. He, he's not my race. He, he's not from my country. He, he, he's not from my group. Sin will always divide us. But the grace of God always unites us. The grace of God expands our heart to see the world as family. And that's the grace I want to pray takes hold of your heart today. Would you just lift both your hands?
is a sign of surrender to the Lord. God, we surrender our hearts to you and we confess that uh, much like Cain, we want to question, am I really my neighbor's keeper? Am I really the keeper of my school, of my co-workers, of my city? Am I really responsible? Sin would tell us we're not. So God, I just pray for your grace to be so radically poured out in our hearts that we would be able to embrace the stranger as family. God, that we would be able to embrace our enemies as friends. That we would embrace the foreigner as now part of our community. God, radically transform our hearts, I pray. Let your grace so radically at work in us, God, that we would be changed. And I pray, God, let it start this week. I pray this week right here in our cities that you would give us opportunity this week, Lord God, to treat somebody like family. Lead us to somebody in our gym, in our school, in our, in our neighborhood, in, in our classes, wherever we go. Lead us to somebody that we can embrace the way you have embraced us. And God, for India, we pray, God, show us what you would have us to do. Lord, Indians are not foreigners to us, they're family. Show us what you would have us to do for that part of our family, how we could be involved. God, speak to us and, and give us grace that would cause us to be radically generous, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Can you show your appreciation this morning? As the worship team comes, I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. I'm not going to belabor the point at all. You've heard a lot of ways today that you can be a part, that you can give, that you can and be effective. We are called to make a difference. Radical generosity. Do we, do we have a heart? Do we care? Are we concerned? Not only about India, but right here at home. People in your neighborhood, your co-workers, your family. The Lord will drop into your heart today, and he probably already has somebody, some way, some place that you can be generous, that you can make a difference, that you can impact. Acts said that there were no needy people among them. May there never be, because we see a need and we help meet that need. Listen, we may not have everything that we need to do that, but God is the God of all resources. And if he says, you go ahead and, and, and help and give, don't you believe that God can give back? It's a promise of his word that we give and it will be given to us. So how, whatever God is leading you to do, I encourage you to do so today. At the very least, we pray. We have an incredible team of missionaries representing India with us this week today I encourage you to stop by their tables at least pick up one of their prayer cards and commit to pray pray that God would use you in some way some place we can't meet every need but we can meet somebody's need and I pray that we would have a heart to listen to God that we would have a heart to listen and if God calls us to go whether it's right here somewhere in our city or if God's calling you to go to some other nation that we'd be obedient to do so and that we would give however he leads us to give. Would you do that? Would you pray with me today? Father, today we give our lives to you and it's not just a word from uh, a song that we sing. We surrender ourselves to you and say, God, here I am, use me. Lord, use us. Help us to see the world around us that is lost and hurt and broken right here at home in our city places around the world where the gospel is being taken into some very dark places and we can partner together to be part of that mission, to be part of meeting the needs there, God. So I just pray that whatever it is that you are, you've got for each and every one of us, that we would listen to your voice, that we would respond with obedience and say yes, God, to you. If there's someone in the room today who has never opened their heart to you, who's never said yes to you as far as being Lord and Savior of their life, Today, God, if you are speaking to them, may they reach out to you and say, Jesus, 
I need you. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to guide my life. Forgive me of my sins. Change my heart. Change my life. I choose you. I want to be a Christ follower. Father, I pray that every person in this room, every person that's joining us online, that is praying that prayer in their heart, as they say yes to you, God, that you are answering that prayer. God, that you are leading us and calling us and sending us out to places all over. May we fill that need, meet the need of people around us, and in doing so, take the gospel message. and May the light and life of Jesus shine bright through our lives in everything we do. In your name we pray, amen.